Okay, welcome guys. We are very lucky to be joined by uh, Simone and Xavier for two very brilliant documentary directors. And we're going to talk a little bit about how they get their archive footage, how they get it, where they get it from, Archive Portal Europe mainly. Um, two documentaries about uh, sort of similar subjects. Uh, we'll start with uh, Simone's, which was called Salty for Fake. Do you want to tell the audience just a little bit about it real quick? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, Fulci for Fake uh, is uh, the first uh, biopic uh, about uh, Italian director uh, Lucio Fulci. Um, Lucio Fulci was, uh, uh, he died uh, in uh, 1996. He was a, a genre movie director. He directed about 60 movies. Uh, from uh, comedy to western, um, uh, from a historical period uh, uh, drama to uh, erotic uh, movies, but uh, uh, is nowadays uh, uh, known all over the world uh, um, for his uh, horror and thrillers, uh, and thriller movies. Uh, Fulci for Fake um, tells the story of uh, Lucio Fulci, um, not uh, in a chronological way, not from uh, A to Z, uh, but uh, it, it, it tries to focus uh, on the man, uh, the man behind the director and uh, how his uh, uh, way of living uh, influenced his way of making movies. Amazing, yeah. Fantastic documentary, uh, as I Thanks. said. Um, Xavier, do you want to go into the, the Years of Lead, which is another brilliant insight? Thank you, and th thanks for having me on this panel. So the documentary That's La Morte, Italian cult film in the Years of Lead, looks at a very turbulent period in Italian history. It lasted from really around 1969 to 1983, and was a period in Italy dominated by left-wing terrorism and right-wing terrorism that resulted in over 14,000 Italians losing their lives. And um, what it seeks to do is assess how this period of trauma impacted on Italian popular film and um, specifically the films that were produced by the prolific Italian production house Dania Film. Dania Film were a production house headed by director Sergio Martino and his producer brother Luciano Martino and they um, they really uh, generated a, a wealth of films from cop movies to giallo thrillers to sex comedies that seem to really directly reflect this turbulent period. So it's the first time Italian popular film has been put under the microscope with a serious lens that links us to this, links it to this terrorist period. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's um, a good overview of it. And the the thing is, what we're mainly here to talk about is the resources you both pulled uh, in terms of archive footage um, for across uh, these periods of Italian cinema, which even though with Fulci mainly was sort of 70s, 80s uh, period of films, with Years of Lead mainly sort of end of the 60s to the 70s. But as is made clear in both the documentaries, so many films were produced within this, you know, 12, 14 year period. So there was, I imagine, a lot of archive footage to gather from because it was, it was such a great volume of, of great film. Um, so uh, I'll put this question out to, to both of you. What was the starting point for gathering the footage? Where, where was the first port of call for that? Uh, as Simone, if you want to go first. Well, uh, how can you make a picture about a director without using uh, uh, scenes from his movies? Um, of course, it's not so unusual. Um, there are lots of documentaries about musicians, uh, about uh, uh, directors, actors, without footage from their video clips, uh, from their movies. When um, me and uh, Giada Mazzoleni, the producer of the of the of Fulci for Fake, uh, started to, to, to argue about uh, uh, this theme. Uh, well, I, I, I wrote the first draft 
uh, with the lots of scenes of uh, moments from Fulci's movies. It was like, uh, okay, Sergio Salvati, the cinematographer uh, um, of Lucio Fulci, talks about the famous scene of the eye splinter in Zombie. Okay, um, so uh, use uh, one minute from Zombie. Uh, Camilla Fulci, the daughter of uh, Lucio Fulci, talks about the success of uh, White Fang. Okay, two minutes from White Fang. So I, I arrived at the end of the draft uh, and uh, there were about uh, 30, 35 minutes of uh, scenes of Fulci's movie. Um, it was not possible uh, for me and for uh, the, pro the production to have uh, uh, so many scenes uh, uh, from Fulci's movie. Um, on one hand, uh, because uh, it, uh, was, it, will be, it was going to be uh, too expensive and uh, also too difficult because uh, the, the, the owners of the, of the rights uh, were uh, several and sometimes it was not so easy <laughs> to discover who had uh, the rights of uh, that movie and uh, the rights uh, were for Italy, uh, worldwide, uh, television, uh, cinema. So it was very, very difficult. And secondly, I, um, we were going to, to have uh, different footage uh, material, uh, like... Uh, um, home movies of uh, the Fulci from the Fulci's family, um, backstages of uh, uh, his movies, and also several pictures, uh, private pictures, and also from from the set. And that kind of uh, material was never seen before. Well, now nowadays you can go. To, <laughs> on YouTube and you can see all the fam most famous scenes from Fulci's movie. Um, audience um, are used to watch uh, movies at home with uh, the, the, smart, the smartphone on one hand and so they, they, they can uh, no, uh, immediately after the ending of uh, a movie like Fulci for Fake, uh, go on the web and see that scenes. Uh, the the uh, never seen before material we found and we used, the audience, uh, well, the audience uh, can watch it only on Fulci for Fake. Yeah, amazing. Um, Xavier, do you want to go into your starting points as well? Yeah, I mean, the starting point for our documentary was slightly different in that fact that it came out of a research project. So um, I'd previously written a number of books and chapters on Italian cult film of the 70s. And um, increasingly, I'd, I'd two things that occurred to me that what was missing was much more of an awareness of that social context. So, you know, previously studies of Italian uh, cult films had, first of all, focused on their filmmakers, directors. Um, they hadn't really focused on the producers, which I, I thought was interesting. And at the time I was sort of thinking through that conundrum, a lot of work had begun filtering through on the importance of producers to the national cinema landscape. So that, you know, bringing the producers perspectives uh, to the fore was one thing that interested me alongside that social context of what was going on in you know why what was going on in Italy at that time to really um, uh, sort of underpin this wave of violent subversive often sexually explicit films and why did they suddenly disappear in the mid 80s you know so that was a kind of almost like a theoretical starting point we then focused on Darnia film um, for two reasons really first of all they answered the producers question 
because they were headed by a very iconic producer in the figure of Luciano Martino. And it's interesting, in, in our uh, research, we actually uncovered a number of Fulci links. So I, I, Simone is right, you know, I mean, some of the films that are Fulci films ended up being Dania products or Dania had a distribution role in them. And that's not immediately apparent. So it was like a, a jigsaw of hidden histories that was really fascinating to uncover. Um, it also answered the social context because um, you can almost chart what Dania are producing, when they're producing them and what's going on in Italy at the time. So in the late mid to late sixties, Dania were producing a number of Italian spaghetti Westerns at the point in which Italy was going through um, a period of um, growth known as the economic miracle, where the rural areas of Italy were sort of being left behind by an urban explosion. And a lot of people have read those spaghetti westerns, which have family ties challenged by an outsider as linked to that period of change. Flash forward to the 70s, you get the giallo, these infamous murder mysteries of which Sergio Martino was a lead director, and actually Fulci. Fulci did some of the first uh, Jello films. And again, that directly links to Italy's changing status within the European Union. So we seem to have a social link there. Flash forward a bit further to the mid to late 70s, um, Dania was one of the lead um, producers of films known as Polizieski or rogue cop movies, which seem to directly relate to that toxic period of, of terrorism. They also did 34 sex comedies. And these sex comedies, although they're often dismissed, again, directly linked to what's happening in Italy at the time, where you have certain uh, legal challenges around female sexuality, around marriage, around abortion. And you also have females entering the workplace for the first time. In a, in a pronounced role. So those films, which often have a very independent heroine, again, directly li linked to that Italian context. So it answered the question about the role of the producer, it answered the question about the context, but crucially, um, Luciano Martina passed away in, in 2013, and Dania um, has, although it's no longer active, has one of the key resources, has a major archive, uh, that it that we requested access to, and they very kindly gave it to us. So that gave us access to a number of still images, a number of um, uh, uh, trailers and extracts, a, a, a number of uh, or, or sort of various bits of uh, uh, censorship dialogue with state bodies. So there was a whole range of materials that that allowed us to access. That really allowed us to bring that project together. Interesting. So there is. Uh, it's not as clear cut as it seems sometimes. You really have to, you really have to look around for this stuff. Um, it does, it's almost like there's a start point, a bit like Simone's documentary as well. There's a start point, but you never know where it's going to end. And we are dealing with hidden histories because the kinds of projects that both of us are, are dealing with are putting on the table directors, producers, organisations that have really been dismissed within the national mindset. So as well as hopefully being interesting. Um, projects that the festival audience want to watch that they are historical projects I guess Simone as well because they are filling the gaps would you agree yeah yeah um, um, about uh, about Lucio Fulci um, I can say that uh, after his death um, several uh, books um, as have been uh, published about him. Uh, several uh, featurette uh, documentaries uh, um, have been uh, shot and uh, included in home video edition of his uh, movies. Um, many things have been said about uh, Lucio Fulci. So the historical point of view of, uh, of Fulci for fake uh, um, was uh, mm, uh, focused on uh, mm, the men and why uh, this genre director uh, found in uh, uh, horror movies uh, the kind of uh, uh, cinema that uh, best uh, portrayed 
uh, his way of being a filmmaker and his vision of uh, the world. So maybe th this aspect is, uh, um, I think, the, 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 the most uh, uh, original um, uh, point of view of uh, true Lucio Fulci. Um, uh, anyway, um, Fulci uh, did uh, shot his movies because Italian industry asked him to do them. He almost never decided what to, to direct. Producers called him and he always said yes. And starting from uh, the end of the, the 50s uh, till the beginning of the 90s, uh, he passed through uh, all the changing in uh, Italian way of making movies. Definitely, 100%. It reminds me, there's a very interesting point brought up in Fulci for Fake at one point, which um, is said, there's a reason that Fulci's films, not all of Fulci's films are in the, the film fan consciousness. They said, you'll see a deluxe edition of The Beyond, and people will buy that, but you, no one's going to go out and buy one of his early films from the 50s, for example, which I think really works into Xavier's point about both these films are really are dealing with hidden history in a sense because if it wasn't for these kind of films and these kind of archives a lot of this would probably just over time be lost and not be brought up for discussion so um, in that sense it's really important um, as opposed to the the interviews you conducted for both the documentaries um, would you say the the archive footage you used was more of a supplement to what they were saying or, or more of an important piece of the films, uh, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, Xavier, do you want to go first? I, I think it's difficult. I mean, one led to the other in, in the case of, uh, of, of That's La Morte because through the Dania archives, you got access to the to the filmmakers and we tried to classify the filmmakers in various uh, sort of subcategories. So you had the director's vision and you'll see a number of quite iconic directors of Italian cult film in the documentary, but also the producers. We had the screenwriter's perspective, the performer's perspective uh, and the musicians. So we tried to sort of subcategorize those, but all of those interviews wouldn't have had the context they had without um, without the Dania material that it was almost like the archive gave us the mind map and the interviews followed and I think it, in a way it's sort of linked in to what Simona said earlier is you you know uh, I'm a big fan of full chief of fake and I, w I was really honored to be to help um, uh, introduce a screening of it at the, at the Mockingbird and I think it, it's it's a really innovative documentary and again it's it's the archives really come to the fore in in that and I think both documentaries are slightly different from the kind of documentaries, which are also great that are out there. And Simone's m mentioned these where they're just endless interviews. Does that make sense without a context? So I, I think th the archive provided the crucial context and without that context, the interviews wouldn't have had the, the, the sort of weight that they require. Yeah, that makes sense. Would you say the same for Thought Chief for Fake, uh, Simone? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um... In, in Fulci for fake, uh, anyway, uh, we, we sold it as a documentary, but uh, it's, a, it's a fictional movie. Yeah. Uh, we have the, 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 the leading actor, Nicola Nocella, uh, playing an actor who's going to be Lucio Fulci in a fictional biopic about the director. So all the documentary, documentaristic parts, uh, like uh, the interviews, uh, like uh, the uh, archive footage, uh, are uh, are seen through his uh, uh, eyes, uh, through his uh, um, uh, 
uh, role in this uh, uh, biopic, he, he, need, he needs to study Lucio Fulci, and so he interviews people, uh, he uh, sees material, um, and uh, the, the, uh, using, uh, using uh, home movies uh, <clears throat> was very important because uh, it, uh, it became a sort of uh, uh, contrast uh, with the fictional uh, structure of the movie. Uh, there's uh, on uh, one side <clears throat> a, a fictional part, the actor going to play Fulci, something fake, and on the other uh, uh, side uh, there are uh, <clears throat> the uh, private uh, uh, footage of the Fulci's family. And uh, the, the legend of Lucio Fulci is based on <laughs> a strange encounter between reality and invention. It, it's really difficult uh, uh, reading uh, um, the, the interviews that Fulci uh, gave uh, when he was alive uh, to understand uh, what is uh, real in, uh, in his tales. And so the, the style, the, the, the form of Fulci for fake uh, portraits uh, this, uh, this ambiguity. Yeah, he, he does that very effectively because starting the film by seeing the actor who's an act, portraying an actor, portraying Fulci, putting the makeup on to look like Lucio, you think it, oh, this is not a normal documentary it does it throws you off in in a, in, a, in a really good way and one thing that stuck out with both documentaries it's they, de they don't feel like they don't feel like supplementary sort of blu-ray extras or dvd extras they are very much their own films because they have their own identities for what they're trying to say uh, and in terms of that you know with the direction you were going in uh, for both of you when you were choosing the archival footage what was the broader context you had to look at um, before you went ahead and, and, and chose it. Uh, Xavier, if you want to start. I, I think alongside that sort of social context I spoke about earlier, I guess the context for using the archive footage was to, to really focus it around three broad areas, three sort of genres or subcategories that we were looking at. And you know, so a, a focus on the giallo, for instance, the, the, the crime thriller and um, trying to link it to what was going on in Dania as a company and also in um, in Italian society. And quite fascinating stuff emerged from the Dania archives, um, as some of which is in the documentary, some of which isn't. Uh, so the, uh, Dania have a lot of the correspondence that um, Luciano Martino and Sergio Martino dealt with in relation to state bodies such as censorship authorities. And for some of their jello, it's really interesting what the censor decided to cut. And so they'd cut certain uh, aspects, uh, maybe for violence or explicitness, but also for uh, to reinforce certain gender stereotypes. So there's one uh, jello with Edwige Fenech that they, they cut a scene or requested cuts for a scene because it made Edwish Fennec look more dominant in an intimate situation and that was quite fascinating so I actually start to think well this social context is is really interesting yeah. same for the second sub genre of the um of the um uh Politsiesky or road cop films and just to get a sense of what we did which is quite interesting was we asked every filmmaker that was interviewed in the documentary to describe where they were the day that at the uh, Italian premiere, Aldo Moro was kidnapped by the Red Wing terrorist group. And that was really fascinating to get that sense of trauma and also to get a sense of filmmakers actually um, being on gun ranges while they're yeah. making movies. So they're getting training on how to use a gun at home while the same time that they're 
that they're making these Danya films. And finally, right. the third subcategory of the um, sex comedies and just seeing how Danya believed that their early roles of women in industrial positions actually forced the military or the police or the airlines to change their employment policies and start taking more women. So those were the choices we made, you know, the genres and again, what's going on in society and trying to link those personal stories to the political. Yeah, it does that. It does that very well because it's it, it, in in some documentaries that go over broad spans of time for the film industry. There's a lot that they give you a lot of information, but the broader political sense sometimes is not there, you know. And then I think a lot of films get hidden under the rug because of that. Films that were poised to be mm. blocked, but even in in the states, you know, films like uh, Black Sunday, they were about terrorist yeah. organizations swept under the rug because it's just not part of the of the um, the consciousness. Uh, Simone, for you, what was the, the context you had to look for for getting your archival footage? Well, the, the, the contest was, uh, <clears throat> as I said, never seen before. And uh, it was not uh, only related to the, to the archive footage, but uh, also um, uh, with the interviews. Um, so between uh, um, collaborators of Lucio Fulci, like Sergio Salvati, the cinematographer, Fabio Frizzi, the musician, uh, people who had uh, talked a lot of Fulci in uh, these years. Um, I wanted uh, some uh, people that never talk about Fulci um, in front of the camera. In particular, the uh, youngest daughter of Lucio Fulci, Camilla, uh, was uh, like disappeared. Uh, she, she worked with her father in all the last movies of uh, Lucio Fulci from 1983 to 1991. And uh, then, then really disappeared. She never um, uh, released an interview. Uh, she, she, uh, she was like uh, uh, missing. Um, this was uh, a, a, an important uh, aspect for us. So, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we want to have a point of view that could be um, both of a daughter and both of a collaborator. And Camilla was the one. And fortunately, she, accept, she accepted to, to make the movie. Um, about the the footage, uh, <laughs> well, when when I when I talked uh, for the first time with the eldest daughter Antonella, a wonderful person, and I asked her to to be part of Fulci for Fake, she said, "Oh yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you know, I am going uh, myself uh, to make uh, a documentary about my father." And I said. Oh, <laughs> oh my god uh, because uh, I, uh, she said I have uh, a lot of uh, home movies and I want to use them but then when when uh, uh, I met her and uh, I explained her uh, the, the, the structure of the movie uh, she said well I think that this is better <laughs> than my idea of uh, of a documentary and uh, and so she 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 gave us her material wow it was it says a lot that this is one of the first you know featured documentaries about Fulci because it could have been a very sort of standard talking heads um interview yeah yeah and, and i I, I can say that uh, uh, this is the, I think, the, the most interesting element uh, of Fulci for Fake, and it is also uh, its uh, uh, limit. Um, some uh, some uh, uh, Fulci fans uh, uh, disliked this way of uh, uh, narrate the story of Lucio Fulci. Uh, some uh, um, I've preferred to see uh, scenes from uh, his uh, movies that they, they, they have 
watched several times, yeah. but I I can understand. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, lots of people that uh, uh, haven't seen any Fulci's movie movies watching Fulci for fake uh, said to me wrote to me that the movie um, was uh, um, so interesting also without scenes from Lucio Fulci's movie that uh, uh, brought them to to see to watch to finally watch mm -hmm. Lucio Fulci's movies yeah. so the absence the absence for someone uh, works better than having uh, lots of scenes uh, in the in Fulci for fake absolutely and as you said it's made in a time where that type of footage is so easily accessible it's kind of your film would hopefully work as a jumping off point for fans that you say have never seen a film of his to go and explore it because you what is great is you don't give them all that on the plate it's kind of if you're interested there's a whole catalog of his films so you can go and, and, and yeah yeah i i must be honest of course if we had the possibility to to use some scenes in in a way that could be for for us convenient maybe yeah we had used them but uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, choosing just uh, one or two scenes uh, that uh, may be what was not the right choice uh, we preferred uh, to have uh, no no uh, scenes from lucio fulci yeah yeah that that absolutely uh, makes sense what the, the things that got me as well with the um the stills of um, him and his crew behind the camera you think you know it's for bigger films it's pretty common to see them but for Fulci you're thinking there's a whole other world behind the camera that we're used to from the films anyway uh, and what I was, was going to ask you Xavier with yours as you said the the genre in Italian cinema you were looking at was so prominent late 60s whole of the 70s through all the different subcultures when it got to the 80s and as you said those kind of films died down uh, was it much harder to find source material for that period of the early 80s or was it still there? It, it was definitely on the decline and I think there's a number of reasons why that, that so-called golden age of Italian cinema did decline. Uh, first of all, from production context, television emerged as a main competitor. So people started divesting uh, economic energies into television um, and Secondly, um, although uh, Italy had always been a, a really innovative competitor to the US in terms of doing movies on a low budget that always look spectacular, new technologies in America uh, sort of uh, progressed and they didn't in Italy. So you started to see the mismatch between the two cultures. But I think as important, you know, um, uh, someone who appears in the documentary is a very influential academic called Ruth Glynn and she's come up with the the concept of trauma narrative she says 1970s in Italy were you, the narratives were trauma narratives people working through their social political anxieties fears of terrorism and gender paradoxes so ultimately she, she says um what happens in the 80s is you get television um, one of the first things that appears on television are the trials of captured Red Brigade terrorists. So you have this kind of outpouring of further anxiety yeah. on the small screen. So yeah. people really wanted to move away from genre entertainment and look more towards nostalgia. So the feel-good Italian movie or the feel-good Italian TV movie takes over. And that's why this period dies so there is in st still indeed stuff in in the Dania archives for the 80s but you definitely get the sense it's a, it's an industry in, dis in decline and I think even Fulci in the 80s he, he carried on working but with a lot of these guys they moved more into kind of TV horror as a way of kind of negotiating that you probably found that Simone that you know you were looking as a career went on of Fulci television was as important as cinema
Yeah, you're, you're perfectly right. Fulci's decline uh, <clears throat> began in, uh, in the 80s when, uh, as you uh, perfectly said, uh, the gap between uh, uh, American movies and Italian movies uh, <laughs> was really big. And also uh, the television uh, changed uh, the way of making uh, of making movies, uh, also because uh, lots uh, of money for the production came from uh, uh, television. Um, Luc Lucio Fulci directed uh, some uh, television movies, very 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 bad uh, movies, uh, um, but uh, uh, his uh, way of being himself as a, a director. Uh, probably ended uh, um, around uh, 1981, 82, uh, in, when in Italy, uh, I, I mean, as in, as in Italian, I can say that uh, American uh, makes make Western, we can make Western. Uh, they make uh, a thriller, we can make it. Uh, they make they make horror. We can make it, but we we can't uh, make uh, movies as Mad Max. <laughs> uh, we we uh, uh, in, in, as uh, Star Wars. Um, when we tried to do science fiction post atomic uh, movies, uh, maybe one or two were good. Then the, the, it was impossible to be at the same level level of uh, of uh, the United States uh, uh, production. Um, coming back to the theme of uh, archive footage, uh, to me it was uh, mm, quite easier to find uh, um, uh, footage. Uh, uh, of Fulci's movies of the 80s, because uh, uh, in particular of the uh, during the end of the decade and the beginning of the 90s, because uh, uh, the uh, several um, uh, fan of uh, Fulci um, uh, had uh, lo-fi camera, uh, videotape camera that used uh, to uh, make uh, some uh, some uh, backstage uh, of uh, his uh, last uh, movies, uh, so uh, uh, not uh, expensive uh, uh, camera uh, was uh, something that uh, <coughs> normal people could uh, buy and then used the going to <laughs> on the set of uh, the, the Lucio Fulci's movies. Um, about the pictures, um, it was uh, the, the, uh, the contrary um, of the Fulci's movies uh, from the beginning of the 60s uh, till uh, the beginning of the 80s. Um, it was uh, possible to, to find uh, lots of uh, pictures from uh, almost every of his uh, movies. Um, they were quite expensive, but uh, you can find them. Uh, in uh, the 80s, uh, the late 80s, um, as um, the production companies of uh, Fulci's movies uh, became uh, little and uh, uh, with the um, not uh, so many monies. Also, the still pictures from the set were uh, well, uh, in a, a number not not so big uh, to be today uh, easily to to find. I talked with uh, some of the still photographer of the last. Uh, movies of Lucio Fulci and they all told uh, to me well I just went on the set for one or two days 
I uh, gave uh, the pictures, uh, the negatives to to the production, I don't know <laughs> where these pictures are. Wow! So it, it's it can almost be a never-ending uh, journey for some of them uh, over such a period of time. That that's that's incredible. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one last question now. Um, just in the sense, as you brought, some of those photos were quite expensive. Obviously, licensing scenes from Fulci's films would have probably been more expensive. What a, a question for both of you. What are the biggest obstacles you've come across in achieving archive footage? Or has it been relatively simple? Uh, Xavier, if you start. I think most definitely the license, licensing fees for film clips. I mean, inevitably, you end up using um what you can you know what are archive materials that you can um that that have been cleared for you and they're normally documents or still images or production context materials or trailers because trailers are you know can be used as clip as clip cleared materials but obviously everyone would love the idea of being able to use in-depth uh, film excerpts but they it's just prohibitive the costs you know, so there's an arch there's an archival hindrance, and I guess there's an age hindrance as well, which is we early spoke about the idea of these these as hidden histories. A lot of these filmmakers are passing away, and so there's a bit of a rush that we try and capture those hidden stories before they, you know, before they leave us. So there's a, a human cost and a almost like a finance cost as well. Yeah, um, was it similar for you, uh, Simona? Yeah, I, I got a previous experience uh, with uh, another biopic uh, that I shoot uh, in 2015. Um, Zanetti's story about Avie Zanetti, the captain of uh, Inter Football Club, uh, Inter Milan Football Club. In that case, the football club Inter um, co-produced the movie. Uh, the rights of the football matches uh, are of the Italian television, national Italian television, but the cl clubs like Inter have the possibility of using that material free in production they made. So we can uh, we in, in could use a, a lot of images, uh, uh, footage from. Uh, <clears throat> the matches of Inter. In um, yeah, in the case of uh, Lucio Fulci, um, I mean, what is uh, the um, financial possibility of earnings of a movie about Lucio Fulci? Lucio Fulci is well known all over the world. I mean, he, he, he has fun in Japan, in the USA, in Germany, in Spain, and so on. But how much? A little bunch everywhere. Mm. So Fulci for fake can be can go everywhere. But of course, <laughs> it's not a hit in no one of these countries. So how can a production think to invest uh, um, thousands of uh, euros uh, in uh, the footage uh, of Fulci's films. Wow. It's, it's so interesting you put it like that because, like you said, those fans that saw the film and were confused as to why there wasn't the footage, you know, not everyone would probably think on that level. And it is, uh, it, it, Fulci, talking about his fans in that sense is the definition of, of cult cinema in a sense it is just people that are getting together because it's a unique thing and documentaries like this like yours serve um serve to enlighten them and hopefully new fans as well um i guess very lastly what is next for both of you guys in terms of films what projects have you got lined up uh Xavier, if you want to start the inevitable quest to try and get funding <laughs> for two <laughs> projects. Um, one is an American-based project, a documentary that we've been developing with Kim Henkel, who wrote The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and that will look at representations of the South in American film. And there's quite an interesting thing that uh, you can trace American images of the South 
to the eugenics movement in America, this kind of uh, very negative pseudo-scientific movement that argued that uh, American Southern dwellers are a different species than the urban dweller. And when that was disproved in America, they actually went on holiday to Italy and then imported that to Italy to say, well, in the rural Italian South, they're a different species to the up. So it's a kind of <laughs> odd thing. So one project yeah. on America, but with an Italian flavor, yeah. a second project again, that, we, that we're trying to get funding for is called um, Fernando De Leo South. And that will look at Fernando De Leo, the director, but again, within that Italian context of him ha as having come from the South and how that culture influenced the kinds of films that he made. Amazing. Right. Best of luck with them. They sound brilliant. Uh, Simone, for you, what's what's next in the pipeline? Well, <laughs> um, Fulci was used to, to, to say that um, one um, um, journalist, a film critic, um, asked, asked me, uh, what's your next uh, movies? I, I replied that uh, another movie, another one. <laughs> Well, I, well I, I'm with uh, Giada Mazzolini, with Paguro Films, so with the same production of um, Fulci for Fate. I'm trying to make uh, another uh, biopic about another Italian Shan director in uh, um, another personal way, but um, I can say anything more <laughs> because oh, okay. my producer <laughs> don't want <laughs> but uh, um, we, we were we were um, we were uh, going to to begin the, um, the shooting on January on this month but because of uh, the emergency the COVID uh, uh, emergency some uh, of uh, the the the, the people involved in the in the movie uh, could not uh, <clears throat> uh, be available to to shoot uh, in uh, in Italy. So uh, now I hope will uh, will start uh, maybe uh, on summer. Amazing, yeah. They both sound brilliant, and as I've said before, I'm a, a big fan of both the the documentaries. It's been a, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Um, Thank you for being on the panel. Thank you for being part of Marcello. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Thank you everyone for watching as well. Hope you learned something. I certainly did. Um, uh, and that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Darius. <laughs> Thanks both of you guys. <laughs>